Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So on August 31st, I spoke at a fantastic conference in the USA as part of the Minds IRL series, which was billed as an event about ending racism, violence, and authoritarianism. It was organized by the very cool team at Mythicist Milwaukee and sponsored by the one and only Tim Pool. It had an incredible lineup of panelists, including Sargon, Dankula, Lauren Chen, aka Roaming Millennial, Hunter Avalone, of course, Tim Pool, and also a number of liberal and progressive speakers, including Tara Devlin, Graham Elwood, Jeff Waldoff of the Young Turks, and Daryl Davis, a black man who de-radicalized over 200 Klan members by sitting down with them and having civil discussions. That's what was so wonderful about this event. It wasn't an echo chamber. Every perspective you could think of was represented, which resulted in some really fantastic and most importantly, entirely civil discussions. I mean, I was on a panel discussing immigration, which is a very intense topic with Lauren Chen, who is a millennial conservative woman with quite similar views to mine, but also Tara Devlin, who's an old school feminist and described herself to me as a raging liberal, and also a musician named Michael Rowlands, who is a genuine bona fide social justice warrior. And the four of us, despite our quite differing views, were able to have a very civil intellectual discussion. And while we realized where we differed, of course, we were all surprised by how much crossover we all had on issues like corporatism and big tech. It was such a good event and made me just so optimistic that yes, there are actually people out there willing to converse. It is so, so important that we keep doing that to somehow de-escalate the current political tension before it turns into something more sinister. If anything is going to end racism, violence, and authoritarianism, events like Minds IRL are going to provide a solid foundation to do so. But regardless of the diversity of speakers and the fact the event was geared at, well, ending racism, violence, and authoritarianism, it still drew the ire of the far left. And even though their views were represented via people like Michael Rowlands, and even though the organizers would have allowed them to speak if they had asked, a number of far left groups still tried to shut it down via a hastily formed Twitter account called No Hate New Jersey. Given this, it is obvious the regressive left doesn't care if their views are represented in the dialogue, they just don't want the dialogue to happen in the first place. They don't want anyone who disagrees with them to have any kind of platform and are happy to lie through their teeth and misrepresent people until they are blue in the face to achieve their end goal of an authoritarian dictatorship where only a set list of opinions are allowed. So, a brief summary of what happened. The event was supposed to be held at the Broadway Theatre of Pittman in New Jersey. Now, all of that was fine with the venue until a couple of weeks before when these far-left groups started an email and telephone harassment campaign aimed at the theater. Threats of violence were allegedly made and the venue received a very, very high volume of, you know, the usual shtick, wild claims that the speakers were violent white supremacist racists who meant harm to minorities and women, all of which was complete rubbish, of course. Anyway, at first the theater was fine and told these online activists that they were not going to cancel the event. However, in a sort of overnight flip, they breached their contract with the organizers and unlawfully canceled the event. They also made misleading statements to the press that the event was canceled totally, which was absolutely not the case, and caused a lot of confusion with attendees. Now, this unlawful cancellation caused a whole host of problems financially and logistically for the organizers. Not only did they have to find another venue on very short notice, but the one they eventually used was three times the cost. They also had to pause ticket sales during this search, so they missed out on the kind of last minute rush of sales that generally happens just before an event. The cancellation led to tens of thousands of dollars in additional overhead costs, thousands of dollars in lost revenue, damage to the reputation of the organizers, who are lovely people by the way, and a loss of countless hours to find a new venue. And all because they wanted to host an event about ending violence, racism, and authoritarianism. What kind of person tries to shut down an event like that? Seriously. <laughs> anyway, the organizers are not taking this lying down. Since they can't go after the activists because they aren't a distinct group, they are suing the theater for unlawfully reneging on their contract. Now this is to send a message to venues and businesses that they must not bend the knee to the far left when they make these empty threats. And trust me, they are empty threats. 
Contrary to the image they present, a lot of the time, these far-left online activists are actually pretty incompetent. Now, don't get me wrong, they are incredibly dangerous when they are on the streets and highly organized in large numbers, like they are in Portland and Berkeley and sometimes in Melbourne. But the group No Hate New Jersey literally only joined Twitter in August, a few weeks before the event was due to happen, and most likely consisted of about five people ringing and emailing under multiple identities and making themselves seem a lot bigger and more powerful than they really are. They are a bunch of liars, and the theatre should have seen through them. Evidence of this is the fact that the event's after-party venue, the Human Village Brewing Company, received a similar aggressive phone harassment campaign, but had the good sense not to cave to the pressure. The result was not some terrible riot or damage to the establishment. All that happened was that a few weedy lefty losers showed up, yelled a few things, got bored because no one was giving them any attention, and left. If the Broadway theatre of Pittman had seen through the theatrics of these far-left morons, that's most likely the extent of any protest their event would have endured. Now, I think it is a really good thing that the organisers are making a statement by suing the theatre. It is all very well to sit around talking about free speech, but we actually need to act on our convictions. So if you want to support these guys from Mythicist Milwaukee, the link to their support page is in the video description. They are hoping to raise enough money from the community to cover their legal expenses in this battle, because honestly, enough is enough. You have to agree with me. So good luck to them. I will be contributing also. This big talk but no action is kind of a pattern with far-left activists. They sit on Twitter and squawk all day, but there actually aren't that many of them relative to conservatives and centrists. They are just particularly noisy on social media, often tweeting the same kind of stuff from multiple different accounts, which gives a kind of false indication of their actual numbers. They also hoard a disproportionately large number of places in the mainstream media and in Hollywood, which gives them access to million strong platforms. That is why they are so easily able to dictate acceptable cultural dialogue. All of which is why it infuriates me so much when businesses and venues mistake them for an accurate representation of public opinion and then capitulate to them. I'll give you another example here. In Australia, our sort of equivalent to Fox is Sky News, particularly what has been colloquially dubbed Sky News After Dark, which refers to the nightly lineup of unashamedly conservative commentators from about 5 p.m. to midnight, presenting sparkling, witty, engaging, and entertaining right-wing commentary. And I'm on twice a week. Anyway, the Australian incarnation of the Twitter far-left activist organization Sleeping Giants has a bit of a ping-on about Sky News. Over the past year or so, it has gone out of its way to grossly misrepresent what is said on the network, eradicate any kind of context, and smear those who appear on it. You know, just the usual tactics employed by the regressive left when they don't have any evidence to counter their opponents, which is, you know, all of the time. Sleeping Giants Oz used these tactics to harangue businesses advertising on Sky, publicly naming and shaming them in order to bully them into pulling out. Now, it all seemed very big and intimidating, as these Twitter campaigns often appear. So, in February this year, Sky News decided to suss it out and did some research on the Sleeping Giants advertiser boycott campaign. Turns out that 43% of the activity among the most active participants in the campaign came from one account, a university lecturer named Andrew Priest. And of the 10 most engaged accounts, 8 of them were anonymous. And if that singular but most enthused 43%er is anything to go by, this indicates that these Twitter campaigns, led by organizations like Sleeping Giants, are headed by only a few idiots who create multiple different accounts. This makes them seem like they have far more reach than they actually do. And look, no offense, but given the age range of people who head companies that advertise on television networks, which is largely over 50, they tend not to have the same grasp of how the online universe works as millennials and Generation Z, so it's very easy to fool companies into believing this kind of campaign is a reflection of public opinion. Further, and even funnier proof that this Sleeping Giants Oz campaign consisted of just a few sad individuals was when they decided to stop acting with their thumbs and actually organize a protest. There were warnings that they were going to storm the Sky News studios in Brisbane, Melbourne and Sydney to protest the so-called evil allegedly far-right rhetoric blasting the screens of innocent Australians. Even GetUp got involved with this protest. 
Now, of course, we braced for the worst. But here's the thing. Zero people turned up in Brisbane, zero people turned up in Melbourne, and only about 25 people turned up in Sydney. And don't they just look the part? None of this should really come as any surprise, at least if you're aware of just how many so-called progressives there actually are. In the USA, for instance, a study of America's political landscape called Hidden Tribes, taken in October 2018, found that of the seven tribes they managed to split the population into, only 8% of them fell into the progressive camp. This is opposed to conservatives who made up 25% of the population and then the rest who are all varying shades of centrist and apolitical. In the case of Australia, now look at it this way. Our favourite party of the regressive leftist activist, the Greens, makes a lot of noise online and has a lot of loud voices in the media advocating for its interests. However, despite all this hoo-ha, they still only get 10% of the vote. That should tell you something about where Australians sit politically. On the strength of these numbers, or lack thereof, of course these extremist activists are not going to be populous or motivated enough to cause any real damage. Look, like I said though, that is not always the case. They are very dangerous when organized and they have a very Machiavellian attitude and also a total lack of empathy for anyone who disagrees with them. Some chapters of these activists should be taken very, very seriously. But by and large, these idiots may make a lot of noise in the media and on Twitter, but often lack the gumption or the numbers to actually do anything. And venues, businesses and advertisers on networks like Sky News and Fox News would do well to realize this. By capitulating to what is a small but noisy minority of morons, you polarize the vast majority of your customer and viewer base, which is just not ideal. As such, all of us need to stop caving to these cry bullies and recognize that they only have as much power as we give them. If you put them and us into a room together, we would vastly outnumber them. The noise they make is not an accurate reflection of popular public opinion, and the sooner we all realize this, the sooner we can stand up to them and stop their stupid boycott campaigns and quest to de-platform people they don't like or silence any kind of debate. As I said earlier, enough is enough. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment, and if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my subscribe star link and other ways you can support me.